but it also means that it's created this instability, that we have a nuclear power that's doing something really bad, and one of the reasons we can't respond more forcefully is because they're a nuclear power. And that's kind of the crux of the dilemma right now for the U.S. as it thinks about Russia and for NATO. What do we do next? Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Eintema, president of World Boston, and it is such a pleasure to welcome you tonight to uh, Great Decisions. We're delighted to be here um, at the wonderful Boston Public Library and also here uh, virtually on Zoom. For the topic of tonight's program, Russia and the United States, uh, there's really no need to um, underscore the importance. Uh, for example, just yesterday, Avril Haines, U.S. Director of National Intelligence warned that Putin is prepared for a prolonged conflict in Ukraine. And as the war enters its 11th week, it's difficult to say where things go from here. Um, so uh, as many of you know, this conflict stems from a much broader historical and geopolitical context and will have a lasting impact um, on the region and on the whole planet. Uh, tonight, very fortunately, Alexandra Vacru will help us understand the many facets of this complex topic. So for the sake of time, I will abbreviate Alexandra's impressive bi biography, but briefly, she's the executive director of the Davis Center at Harvard University. Uh, she uh, addresses many Eurasian, sorry, Russian and Eurasian policy issues in her research and uh, teaches popular courses on comparative politics of the region. Uh, so Alexandra lived in Moscow from 1992 to 2004, and while she was there, uh, among other positions, she was a consultant for the Russian Privatization Agency, partner and head of sales, Brunswick Warburg, and active member of the board of United Way Moscow. So, so um, anyway, more on that at another time. So um, I'm going to skip ahead, but please do have a look at her um, bio online. Um, I'll just mention that uh, you uh, can see her from time to time, or frequently these days, numerous news outlets, including NPR, CNN, Fox News Radio, China Central TV, and Hromadsky TV in Ukraine. Um, and she speaks regularly at forums such as tonight's around the world. So, uh, you know, I actually am just going to stop right here and say that this is a little bittersweet um, or maybe a little vertiginous. Um, Alexandra and I have known each other for some time. Uh, we go way back in Russia and the region with our experience, and probably some of you uh, here do too. Um, the years kind of fall away. Um, who'd have imagined back in the day that we'd be doing this talk? It, it's great. Um, at the same time, who would have imagined this catastrophic war? Well, uh, maybe some did. But in any case, uh, we have with us tonight exactly the right person to help us understand how we got here and maybe how Russia and the region can get back on track uh, for peace and prosperity. So go for it, Alexandra. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, and thank you all for coming. Let's see where we are. Okay, the war in Ukraine. I'm going to divide my talk into three sections. I'm going to start by talking about the past, which I think is really important to understanding the war now. I'm going to talk about what's happening now in Ukraine, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more analytically about what we think that Putin wants and what the Western response has been and why it hasn't gone in different directions. So hopefully I'll set the stage for all of your questions afterwards. Um, please save them up because that's the most fun of all of these conversations. So let me start. I don't have a clicker, but I have a map. Actually, I have lots of maps. So this is, I don't want to call it the good old days, but this is the Soviet Union. Um, you can see that big pink section is Russia. Russia is still very large, even though it's not the Soviet Union, but it's surrounded by a number of countries, 14 countries to be exact, only at that time they weren't countries. They were called Soviet Socialist Republics, and even though the Soviet Union was, as it implies in its name, a union, a federation from which countries could theoretically secede at will, 
In fact, it was a single country, and in many ways, it was the continuation of the Russian Empire, which looked very much like the Soviet Union looked. It had Russia as its central point of gravity, and then it had smaller countries uh, around it, primarily to the west and to the south. Now, the area that we are talking about now when we talk about Ukraine and the West and Europe is the circled section, and let me move in a little bit. And these are the countries that are in the news most often now. So again, Russia, that's that pink section. Ukraine, yellow, much larger than it appears on this map, right? Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe, 44 million people. And just to put that in perspective, Russia is about 144 million people. So Ukraine is a little bit less than a third the size of Russia in terms of population. Not in terms of territory, of course, but even in terms of territory, it's as big as France, it's as big as Texas. If you superimposed it on uh, New England, it would actually stretch all the way to Chicago. It's a big piece of land. Next to that, you see the little purple crescent to the west, that's Moldova which is also in the news and also quite nervous these days. And to the north of uh, Ukraine, you see Belarus, which um, has been implicated in the conflict because it allowed Russia to stage troops there before, before the war began. And then to the north of that, you see the three Baltic countries, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. They are now part of the European Union. They got out of the Soviet Union as soon as they possibly could. And they had only been there since after World War II. So they were in the Soviet Union a much shorter period of time than the 70 years that the rest of those Union Republics were part of the Soviet Union. And that's what made it relatively easy for them to get into Europe more quickly. If we speak in geopolitical terms, this is what Cold War Europe looked like. So the mustard colored uh, USSR is there in the east. And we've also colored the same attractive color, all of uh, Eastern Europe that was part of the Warsaw Pact. So Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Eastern Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, all those countries were part of the Warsaw Pact, which was an answer to NATO, the Western military alliance that included in these uh, olive green colors, France, Germany, Turkey, uh, Iceland, the UK, all of those countries were part of NATO and are still part of NATO. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, many of those countries of the Warsaw Pact in Eastern Europe decided very quickly that they actually would rather be a member of NATO. They understood that the Russia had been, to some degree, always a threat, a threat that they weren't able to resist during the Cold War. But as soon as they had the opportunity, they asked for membership in NATO. And it's a pretty long procedure. It didn't happen right away. There were several waves. But you can see that the, in, during these waves, you have the gradual movement of the NATO border further and further to the east. And let me put those two maps next to each other so you can see. Um, I've tilted it so that they're in the same perspective. Um, and that orange band of countries on the right, those are the new members to NATO, and that represents 600 miles of NATO getting closer to Russia. And I mention this because this is one of the things, one of the arguments that Russia has made when explaining why it is that it desperately needs to keep Ukraine out of NATO. I'm, I'm not saying that they're right. I'm not saying that NATO is going to attack Ukraine, but I think it's really important to understand the Russian perspective and where they're coming from. And so if you look at this map and you understand how NATO has moved to the east, you can sort of see why they would be more threatened by that. That's Ukraine joining NATO especially since we now know that Finland and Sweden are also interested in joining NATO. So one of the paradoxes of the war is that Putin was afraid of having NATO so close to the borders, and as a result of the conflict, he's actually made NATO move much closer, at least in the north, with Sweden and Finland. And Finland is particularly significant because it was always in between east and west. It had been invaded by Russia, and in order to maintain its sovereignty and its independence, they had come to an agreement with Russia that they wouldn't really move against it and the Soviet Union. They wouldn't really take a foreign policy that was in opposition to the Soviet and the Russian foreign policy. This was called Finlandization. And that's also important because it's been mentioned as a possibility for Ukraine. Like maybe Ukraine isn't totally independent. Maybe it's like Finland, a sovereign state, but careful to mind Russia's interests. We'll get to that later. So that's kind of the historical background of what Russia is talking about when it thinks NATO is aggressive. Now, what NATO did not do is 
um, stationed some kind of biological factories in Ukraine. Uh, NATO was not planning on putting military bases in Ukraine. In fact, NATO had told Ukraine that the chances of it getting admitted to the alliance were extremely slim. And the reason for that is that there was a civil war going on in Ukraine, thanks to the Russians. In 2014, and I'm going to get into this also, they annexed Crimea, and they also created separatist movements in the east of Ukraine. And because NATO is predicated on the idea that any single country that's attacked is going to be defended by all the NATO members, there is no way that the alliance would take into its midst a country that has a civil war, because the possibility of them, them claiming that they were attacked is very high. So Ukraine had no hope of getting into NATO, for a long, long time at least. Now, let's switch a little bit to the present. Uh, as you know, Russia invaded in, uh, February, on February 24th of this year, uh, but this didn't come exactly out of the blue. And I'm sorry, I need to put another map here. This is Ukraine, right? Enough of talking about the Soviet Union and Russia. Let, let's talk about Ukraine directly. And this is Ukraine in 2014, 2015. As you probably remember, in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, that's that southern red section, without firing a single shot. Or if they fired a shot, they didn't hit anybody. And the way they managed to do this was to take advantage of the fact that Sevastopol, or Sebastopol as it appears on this map, was the largest uh, base for the Russian naval fleet anywhere in the world. They rented, the Russians rented that base from the Ukrainians. They had a very long-term lease that they were unlikely to lose. But a lot of the population of Crimea had worked at that base, was Russian-speaking, uh, and was fairly friendly to the Russians. And you can see from this map, the colors indicate the extent to which the population is primarily Ukrainian-speaking, or Ukraine as a first language, and primarily Russian-speaking. And Crimea was primarily Russian-speaking. This is also part of an accident of history because Khrushchev actually gave Crimea to the Ukrainians in 1954 as a present. It didn't really matter because it was all part of the Soviet Union, but nonetheless, he took it away from the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic and he gave it to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republics. So in 2014, the narrative goes, Russia took back what was rightfully its own. So that's one special situation. But after that special situation, Russia discovered that maybe it could actually get more territory by fostering separatist desires in the populations of the countries along the south and the east. So not just Donetsk and Luhansk, which you see in orange here, but further south, Mariupol, which is in the news a lot these days, down through Kherson. And the Russians promoted some separatists who wanted to be part of Russia. They encouraged them to take over administration buildings, to you know, set fires in the streets. There were some unpleasant scenes and uh, protests, but eventually the Ukrainian authorities managed to take control of those cities, everywhere except Donetsk and Luhansk. Donetsk and Luhansk are part of the Donbass, a, a rich coal area. And what's interesting here is that you can see that the part that the Russians and the, or the rather, sorry, the Ukrainians Russian-backed separatists com controlled the orange part was not even the entire region. So a region is kind of like a state, and you can see here the, the larger purple section around the orange section represents the rest of the Donetsk state and the Luhansk state. And that separatist movement was not so popular that they managed to hold the whole administrative territory. They just held the area around the capital, between the capital and the Russian border. This was the state of affairs for eight years. Now, it wasn't quite as calm as it appears on this map. Right? 14,000 Ukrainians lost their lives fighting the civil war. The line of contact between the purple and the orange section was always facing um, violations of the ceasefire, and the OECD had a 700-person for, force that was constantly monitoring the line of contact and reporting on, on uh, conflicts and interactions. Uh, but it, it really was pretty stable in the sense that a frozen contract is, conflict is stable. So it's not that there was no fighting, it's just that neither side was advancing until February 24th. So what did Russia try and do? It was a wildly ambitious plan. In fact, it was so ambitious that a lot of people in Ukraine, um, in Europe, in Russia did not believe 
that the Russians were actually planning on invading. And just to tell you sort of how widespread this idea was, I had been giving a talk since November uh, entitled, Will Russia Invade Ukraine? Showing the maps that we've all seen, right, that we were all seeing in the New York Times and the FT, like everyone was showing all of these troops massing around the border in Belarus and in Russia and in Crimea. And, uh, and I was saying, you know, it, it looks like something's going to happen. We don't know for sure, but it certainly looks like that. And the Harvard Club of Moscow asked me to give a talk. These are Russians who went to Harvard, to one of the schools, um, and I've spoken to them from time to time. They asked me to give a talk again, and this was about February 20th, and I said, well, I'm, I'm really busy. Like, how about in two weeks? And they're like, two weeks? Nothing's gonna happen in two weeks. Like, the whole thing will be over in two weeks. And so they said, let's do it this week, but they retitled it, and their new title was, Why Does the U.S. Think That Russia Will Invade Ukraine? And they just didn't believe it. One of the reasons they didn't believe it is that 200,000 troops, which is what was amassed around Ukraine, is actually not enough to take control of a country of 44 million, right? The troop to task ratio, if you will, is just not, not in your favor. And the only reason that the Russians would have thought that this number of troops and materiel would be enough to take Ukraine is if they believed that this was going to be super easy. And sure enough, we heard from the soldiers that were captured in Kiev, the Russian soldiers, that many of them had brought parade dress with them in their tanks because they thought they were going to be having a parade in Kiev three days later. They didn't have enough meals, they didn't have enough supplies. A lot of them didn't even know where they were and what the mission was. Um, and they were just convinced, or the, the leadership was convinced, that this was going to be a cakewalk. How is that possible? Well, one of the interesting side effects of the annexation of Crimea was that Russia started seeing Ukraine as a domestic situation and not an international situation. It didn't involve another country. It involved kind of a subset of Russia. And we were having these meetings of a working group on US-Russia relations. We've been meeting twice a year for 10 years, and we always wanted to put Ukraine on the agenda after 2014. And the Russians never wanted to because they said, you know, we are international relations people, and Ukraine is an issue for like the domestic people. They're, they're different people. We don't work with them. We can't talk about Ukraine. The effect of that was that there was very little expertise on Ukraine inside of Russia. And they essentially missed the change and the resurgence of nationality in Ukraine that came as a result of the annexation of Crimea and the civil war in the East. They failed to notice that Ukraine, which was a country that had what, what we call in political science cross-cutting cleavages. So uh, the western part of Ukraine was Catholic, the eastern part was Russian Orthodox. The eastern part had been part of the Russian Empire, the western part had been part of the Austro-Habsburg Empire. Uh, the western part spoke Ukrainian, the eastern part spoke Russian. There were all of these differences between the east and the west. And the Russians failed to notice that since 2014, the Ukrainians had had a reason for existing as a unified state in order to oppose Russia. So when the Russians move in, in February, they encountered tremendous resistance, as you know. It was so effective that even though this is what the map looked like on February 25th, by uh, last week, the map looked like this. And the parts that the Russian had occupied are either in purple, that's Crimea and the part of Donetsk and Luhansk that they occupied before, and then the red sections are centered around Mariupol in the south and north of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk in the, uh, in the east. But one of the things that's really important to understand is that just looking at these maps doesn't really tell you what's going on the ground what's going on on the ground. And in some ways, it reinforces the Russian narrative that they're doing quite well, right? This is what they're telling people in Russia. Things are going okay. We are taking control of a land bridge from Crimea all the way through Donetsk and Luhansk. This is working really well. But if you look at a map a little bit differently, like this one, this is what the situation looks like a little bit more on the ground. It shows you the red sections are indeed largely controlled by Russia, but there are big pockets or bubbles in that where the Ukrainians are still fighting back. So we want to be really careful not to read too much, even though I've just shown you 10 maps. Don't read too much into maps, right? Because there's a lot of things happening that we can't see from that. And of course, the other thing that we can't see is what it looks like on the ground. 
This is uh, part of the horror of Bucha that we all became aware of after the Russians pulled out of the Kiev area. It's not just all of the equipment littering, littered around. There were bodies, of course. Uh, looks like evidence of war crimes. Uh, and pretty much most of the places that are occupied or were occupied by Russia end up looking like this. And this is in part because Russian military strategy is such that like, they just are going to level everything. If they don't get people to surrender, they're just going to blast the place to bits and convince people to leave or to surrender. This is what they did in Grozny in Chechnya in the 90s. This is what happened to Aleppo in Syria. And this is what's happening to Ukraine. I'm sure you've seen pictures of Mariupol. There's basically nothing left. The other thing that these maps don't tell us is what is Putin thinking? Like, what, what does he want from this conflict? So we know that he would like to keep Ukraine out of NATO. We know that he would like to keep NATO as far away from the borders as possible. Neither of those are looking terribly good at the moment. But we also know that Putin would like to be considered a great power. And one of the biggest offenses that he has received is when Obama referred to Russia as a regional power in a dismissive way. So what's the difference between a great power and a regional power? Well, a great power has, let's say, a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. Check, Russia has that. Uh, a great power has a sphere of influence. So countries around it that it doesn't control directly, but who are friendly enough that they will not do things that will threaten the security of the larger country. And before we say it's totally unreasonable for a country to want that, let's remember that we basically have that in the US, right? Mexico, Cuba, uh, those are places where we don't necessarily directly control the politics there, but we're pretty sensitive to what goes on. In the 1960s, when the Soviets tried to put missiles in Cuba, like that did not go down well. The other thing that Putin wants is to prove that he's not a regional power by projecting power abroad. So a regional power can do something to its neighbors, send in troops, you know, help Lukashenko out when he's putting down uh, protests in Belarus, but doesn't necessarily project power away from its borders, which is much more difficult. Russia did that. Russia did that in Syria. Russia is the only reason that Bashar al-Assad is still in power in Syria, because he intervened at the moment where Assad was likely to fall and made sure that they had the military support to protect the regime. The other thing that Putin cares about is domestic legitimacy and his popularity. So this is a, an interesting graph of the approval ratings. Uh, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but I can tell you the dark blue line at the top is approval. The lighter blue line is disapproval. And what's probably surprising for the American eye is that the approval rating for Putin basically hovers between 60 and 80% all the time, right? It's kind of stratospheric by our standards. And let's not be too literal about these. Let's not assume that that means that you know, eight out of 10 Russians are very gung-ho for Putin. But relatively speaking, he does have a significant amount of popularity. And what's important here, and the reason I show it, is that you can see that big spike in 2014 comes after the annexation of Crimea. So Putin annexes Crimea, and his approval rating jumps from around 60% to 80%, and stays there for about three years until corruption scandals come out. I don't know if you've seen the Navalny scandals, the Navalny videos, for example, but they were all about corruption among the elite and within Putin's inner circle. And his popularity starts to come down as a result. So it's possible, we don't know for sure because we're not talking to Putin, that he thought that perhaps by going into Ukraine, taking another piece of Ukraine, which was so easy when it came to Crimea, he would be able to boost his popularity again. And why is this important? It's important because authoritarian regimes can't rely on elections for legitimacy, right? They can't say, I won the vote by 80%, let's say. I have a mandate and I can do whatever I want because the elections themselves are not entirely perceived as legitimate. So the authoritarian needs to have a different way of proving that he's needed, that he is the one who should be running the country. And we can think of this as a social contract. So when Putin arrives on the scene in 2000, he has a social count contract that reads something like this. I am going to fix the chaos of the 90s. I'm going to return prosperity and stability to the country. He was a law and order candidate, if you will. Um, and in exchange, you're going to let me run the country the way I see fit and let me and my cronies get pretty rich. And for most people, exhausted by the 1990s, this was a good deal. 
like they were in the mood for some calm, prosperity, economic growth, stable jobs, you know, less violence in the streets, maybe more unified federal policy and less regional independence, like that was a good deal. The problem was that that good deal depended on a lot of social spending. It depended on Putin having enough money to be able to spend more on pensions, to improve hospitals and polyclinics, to um, build new houses for people because there was a housing shortage. And as the oil price started to come down in 2007 and 2008, he basically ran out of money to support his end of the social contract. So he had to come up with a different contract. Right? And the new contract seems to have been more along the lines of, you let me run the country the way I see fit, and you let me and my friends get rich, and in exchange, I will make Russia great again. And he demonstrated that with Crimea. Like, again, we managed to take more territory, we took back what was ours, and I have to say, having been in Moscow during that period in March 2014, after the annexation of Crimea, there was a sense of joy Right? People were totally into it. They were tying like those orange and black ribbons on their car antennas. I was in Red Square for one of the rallies with big Putin flags. Like, there was a sense, not among everybody, but among a lot of people, that this was a good thing for Russia. So maybe he thought that he was going to get the same boost and the same popularity and do the similar thing uh, a, a second time. But I think even more compelling is Putin's concern with his reputation. So Vladimir the Great here doesn't actually refer to Putin. Putin is one of the little guys at the bottom. Vladimir the Great refers to the 60-foot statue behind him. Vladimir the Great was a prince who lived a 1,000 years ago, who has become the founding hero of Russia. I mean, in some ways, he was the founding hero before. But he has enjoyed what we could call a popular resurgence recently. Because he was the prince who first unified the lands of Kievan, uh, the Kiev principalities and the Russian principalities, and also was baptized in Crimea, thereby setting Russia on a Catholic trajectory. So he's in some ways the founding father of, of Russia. Interestingly, in Ukraine, he's known as Volodymyr the Great, right? And he's also the founding father of Ukraine because most of this happened in Ukraine, which was actually more powerful than the Russian principalities at the time. But I suspect that Putin would be super happy if in a thousand years people were looking back and calling him Vladimir the Great for again unifying the Russian and the Ukrainian lands and enforcing the idea of traditional values in Russia. So that could also be one of the important motivators for him. Now, what has the U.S. done in response? And by U.S., I mean U.S. and West because we've actually had a very unified response. The first thing is plane loads unbelievable amounts of military aid that has gone from the US and from Europe into uh, Ukraine. So we've all heard about like the Javelins, the Stinger missiles, anti-tank, anti-aircraft weaponry. Um, now they're allowing certain tanks and aircraft even from NATO countries to go into Ukraine. It's a little complicated because the Ukrainians are only trained on the old Soviet equipment. So they're making deals where NATO countries like Poland, who had a lot of Soviet equipment, are giving that to Ukraine and getting an upgrade from the US in return. So everyone's um, kind of getting what they want out of that. But that's only part of the response. And I would say, it, even though it's very important to, um, to keeping you, Russians from winning on the ground, uh, there have been other very important responses as well. And those have come in the form of sanctions. There are four different kinds of sanctions, and I'll, I'll talk about all of them in a second. So one is financial, right? That's targeting central bank reserves, uh, the SWIFT information system that allows banks to talk to each other, which is kind of the plumbing in the international financial system, um, and also access to dollars. So if any of you have ever transferred money someplace uh, abroad, your bank probably has a correspondent bank in New York that it uses for these transactions. And even transactions that don't involve the dollar, like let's say a German is buying something from Japan, often end up going through the dollar because the German bank and the Japanese bank We'll have correspondent accounts in New York, which is where the, the exchange of money actually happens before it's converted back into the other currency. So if you don't have access to your correspondent bank, you're basically frozen out of international transactions. There's also been very important sectoral sanctions. So avionics, like 
no aircraft parts or engines or anything involving airplanes is getting into Russia. And even though China is not part of the sanctions package, China has also refused to send in some aircraft parts to Russia. Semiconductors, semiconductors are almost in everything. Like you remember when we had the chip shortage and like you couldn't get a car for, for three or four months? Well, Russia is now facing an indefinite chip shortage. Uh, and that has very important implications for manufacturing in Russia. There's also individual sanctions, princelings, oligarchs, uh, close members of Putin's family like his daughters are getting sanctioned so they can't travel and they can't uh, use their American Express cards abroad. Uh, and then there's self-sanctioning. There are all of the corporates who are deciding that Russia is so toxic, they look bad by doing business there and they're pulling out. Now, you might think that, you know, how much does that affect the Russian economy? Well, McDonald's employed 62,000 people in Russia so that's a lot of people who are now unemployed. They're still getting paid because a lot of the big companies said that they would pay their employees for three months. IKEA just said they were going to extend it for six months. So that hasn't really started to bite yet, but it will. And you also have companies who were um, supervising manufacturing in Russia. So the plant might be um, you know, partially Russian owned, but if it had Western supervision or management, that's gone now. And then you have individuals that are self-sanctioning. You have brain drain. Most of the IT specialists appear to be leaving. In fact, it's so bad that at the airport in Moscow, they now have a sign saying, are you an IT specialist? You don't have to leave, right? And there are all sorts of programs to try and get them to stay. We don't know how many people have left, but the numbers seem to be between uh, 500,000 and a million. And these are the entrepreneurial middle class on which Russia's ability to really survive and restructure in the future to some extent depend. They're gone, they're in uh, Armenia or Georgia or Kazakhstan. If they had uh, Schengen visas and got into Europe, they're in Poland or Berlin or the Baltics. Uh, very few have come to the US just because it's a lot more difficult to get here. Um, but there is an enormous amount of brain drain. So let me just give a few details on, on all of those areas. So first, in terms of sanctions, uh, when we had been talking before the invasion of what the nuclear option would be and how we would punish Russia, we were talking about kicking them out of SWIFT, the, the plumbing system that I was talking about. But it turned out there was an even more nuclear option that was on the table, which was freezing the central bank's reserves. So it's not true that countries keep their reserves, like in bags of cash in the basement, let's say, of the Kremlin. Right? Countries keep their global reserves in banks in other countries. And at least half of Russia's foreign currency reserves were actually in foreign bank accounts. Sounds pretty logical when you think about it. And now they don't have access to those. So Putin, who had built up a rainy day fund of $640 billion, now finds himself with, let's say, $150 billion of that actually available. That's whatever he had parked in China and what he might have uh, actually in the basement of the Kremlin. So that's going to hurt. The second thing involves manufacturing. So this is Ural Wagon Zavod. They produce tanks, um, but they produce tanks with imported parts, like semiconductors. They don't have semiconductors anymore, so they are no longer producing tanks. That's also true of cars. You know, they manufacture cars in Russia, but they're actually assembling the cars. They're not making all of the parts. Those supply chains were really intensely integrated, and now they are broken in a way that makes COVID look like a bad dream. Right? They are not going to be able to restart manufacturing for a long, long time. Then in terms of the individual sanctions, well, it's hard not to you know, feel a little smug about these. The yachts, everybody loves to see a yacht confiscated. Uh, you see here um, Foreign Minister Lavrov and his daughter and Kremlin spokesman uh, Peskov and his daughter who says, I'm upset because I love to travel and I love different cultures. Uh, and then Pyotr Avin, who was one of the oligarchs, he's now stuck in London and he doesn't even know if he can afford a cleaning lady, as he told the Financial Times. <laughs> yeah. But one of the important things hasn't been sanctioned, right? And that's oil and gas. So Russia hasn't really faced the pain of sanctions, if you will. At the retail level, the stores still have had inventory, so they're getting a little bit thinned out now, but for the most part, People have been able to buy what they want. Maybe fewer imported goods, but a lot of the domestic goods are there. And after 2014, when Russia was sanctioned for invading Crimea, uh, some of those sanctions meant that the country did a much better job of import substitution, of switching from foreign mozzarella to Russian mozzarella. 
It doesn't taste the same, but it's okay, right? It's okay on pizza. And they did that with a lot of goods. So there's, there's not going to be starvation in Russia as a result of the sanctions. The other thing is that oil and gas revenues can run to a billion dollars a day. So the foreign minister of Europe said, I was pretty shocked, after about a month of war, he's like, yeah, it's great. Like Europe collectively has sent a billion dollars in military equipment to Ukraine. And in that time, we have sent $35 billion to Russia in, in exchange for oil and gas. So as long as Russia is still getting 700 million to a billion dollars a day from selling oil and gas, they can keep going for quite a while. And they are. The problem, of course, is that cutting off oil and gas is really not so easy, right? It sounds like you just kind of turn off the tap, but um, it, it's kind of hard for us to imagine because we are essentially self-sufficient in oil and gas, right? We had 8% of our imports were Russian oil and like they were turned off and we felt a bump in prices, but you know, we were still able to heat our houses. If Europe is cut off of Russian oil and gas or decides to cut itself off, like they are not going to be able to have enough heat in their houses next winter. Like it's not turning down the thermostat from 72 to 70, it's like down to 50. And some of the manufacturing that re re relies on those feedstocks and on those hydrocarbons, they're going to be rationed. So that means economic recession, that means reduced growth, possibly increased unemployment, like very serious consequences. The Europeans might decide that it's worth it, but we shouldn't underestimate the economic cost to them. When it comes to the economic cost in Russia, it, it's been pretty severe, not as severe as for Ukraine, which is projected to uh, see a GDP drop of 46% this year, but still, in Russia, they're forecasting you know, an 11 to 12% drop in GDP this year before there's a little bit of recovery. Is that going to hurt the average Russian? Eventually it will, but it's going to take a while. It's going to take those store shelves emptying a little bit more. And as a friend of mine in, in Moscow explained, like people aren't really going to feel the impact of sanctions until they have to change their plans. Right? So, oh, I, I can't go on vacation you know, in Poland the way I was planning. Or um, my daughter, like I won't have enough money for violin lessons, that's bad. Uh, I can't fix my tooth because there are no parts now for the dentist um, and I can't afford it. Like when people start changing their plans, right? And everybody's plans are kind of different in terms of size and ambition, then they're going to start thinking that like maybe there is a personal cost to this conflict. Right now, there really hasn't been. I mean, Moscow does not look like this. This is 1992. This is what people remember. And they're like, okay, like sanctions are not so bad. It doesn't look like this. In fact, on Monday, Russia looked like this. This was the Victory Day parade. Um, and people were out on the street. They were um, celebrating the end of World War II. It, it doesn't look so bad, right? So then we ask ourselves, you know, why not do more? Why aren't we sending more aid to Ukraine? Or why aren't we squeezing Russia even harder? And there are a couple reasons for that. One is that Ukraine has never been defined as a vital national security interest. It's important, for sure. And as one of the best democracies or lone democracies in that part of the world, like we really believe that they're important and we should stand up for them. But after the, the debacles of Iraq and Afghanistan, the US is much more careful about defining interests so that it doesn't have to go and invade a country whenever something happens that it doesn't like. Now, we might decide that Ukraine should be a vital national interest and that we might be willing to put boots on the ground, but we're not there yet. The other reason we're not there yet is uh, partially because they're not part of NATO, so we have no treaty obligation to come to their defense, but also there's no popular support for a war in Ukraine right now. And Biden has slipping ratings because of inflation, right? That's even before you start talking about the war. You can't mobilize the country into putting boots on the ground in Ukraine without having more popular support. And of course, there's one more important reason why we haven't done more, which is Russia's a nuclear power, right? And not just a little nuclear power, like Russia has a lot of nuclear weapons. What we're worried about are not the ICBMs, you know, that they lob across the Atlantic and take out Chicago and then we take out Ekaterinburg. Like, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're really worried about are tactical nuclear weapons. So tactical nuclear weapons are small nuclear weapons, um, perhaps smaller than what was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Still terrible, needless to say. But in theory, they're used not to destroy cities, 
the way strategic nuclear weapons are used, like that's the other part. They're used for battlefield advantage, you know, as if you were going to be able to win a, a war by dropping nuclear weapons on the opposing side. And of course, they wouldn't necessarily have to be dropped directly on Ukrainian soldiers, right? They could be dropped on some empty woods in the Carpathians, the mountains, just to prove a point that Russia is willing to use them. And when we ask ourselves, like, would they really use nuclear weapons? Fiona Hill, who was a national security advisor under Trump, you know, she tells us, like, whenever we ask, like, would Putin really do this? Do we really think he would go that far? And the answer is usually, oh, yes, he would. So I'm not saying that he will do that, but I'm sure he's thinking about it, and I'm sure he's considering it. So far, he hasn't done any extreme moves like cyber attacks, you know, that would, say, take out power to American hospitals or European hospitals. They've been very careful about not targeting the NATO equipment that's being shipped across Ukraine, and those, they're coming on trains, basically. They could be hit. They haven't been hit. So the Russians understand that escalation is potentially even costlier. And I think it's because they assume that NATO would actually then react by putting troops on the ground, and then we're looking at World War III. So we're in the midst of what political scientists call the stability-instability paradox, which is the fact that we had nuclear weapons on both sides, and we had the system of mutually assured destruction that meant that if they did lob that ICBM at Chicago, we were going to take out their cities and the whole world is over in five minutes. But it also means that it's created this instability, that we have a nuclear power that's doing something really bad, and one of the reasons we can't respond more forcefully is because they're a nuclear power. And that's kind of the crux of the dilemma right now for the US as it thinks about Russia and for NATO. What do we do next? So I don't have the answer to that. That's why I stop here, and then I take your questions. <laughs> And I imagine we have a bunch of questions. We have a bit of time. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a question going back to, in, I believe I'm going to go 91 when Ukraine voted for independence, when the Soviet Union fell apart. How did it break down in some of those regions? Did the Crimeans vote for, for independence, for instance? What was the, or the Donbass regions, those, those regions? Did any, anybody break down what the percentage of those people who voted for independence in 91? So, I don't remember if there was a nationwide referendum on independence. No, there, yes, there was, okay. So I don't know what the breakdown was, but the, the act that broke apart the Soviet Union and created independence was actually signed by Yeltsin Kravchuk, who was the head of, uh, of Ukraine, who actually died yesterday, uh, Shushkevich, who was mm -hmm. in Belarus. They went out to a hunting lodge in, in Minsk, um, may or may not have gotten drunk, and came up with an agreement to dissolve the Soviet Union. And that's actually what de facto created independence for those countries because the Soviet Union no longer existed. In terms of the, the popular reaction, there was always, as I mentioned, this division between East and West in Ukraine. And there was a sense in Eastern Ukraine that they, they, were, they were, had an affinity to Russia, right? They had a lot of economic ties with Russia. And you know, until the war, it was pretty clear that Ukraine could not survive economically without Russia. So it was never the case that, you know, we, we either want to be completely in the West or completely with Russia. There was always the hope that there were going to be the possibility of working in both directions. The thing that kind of blew this apart was in 2014, Crimea was annexed, and the president was Yanukovych. And because the country had been so split, the presidency tended to waver. Like, first there was a pro-Western president, and in the next election there would be a pro-Russian president, and then it would go back to a pro-Western pro president. And Yanukovych was the Russian candidate, but he was trying to straddle the West and, and Russia. And he actually got into some very intensive negotiations with the EU over joining, not as a member, but as a kind of participant in the European economy, which would be good for, for Ukraine. And the Russians freaked out, right, and said, look, like here, you're in our sphere of influence, like we don't want you joining Europe. And that drove enormous crowds of people out onto the street because they said, you know, Ukraine is part of Europe, we want to be part of Europe. Yanukovych then flees, um, allegedly, according to the Russians, because the USA organized a coup against him, right? And anyway, that's not entirely true either. But the fact is that the Russian guy leaves, and then you have a new opportunity. 
in that new opportunity, there's a temporary government, and that one of the first things they do is install a law that makes it illegal to speak Russian, or illegal to consider Russian as one of the official languages. A very bad move, right? That really solidifies the feeling in the eastern part of the country, like even if they were ambivalent about Russia before, they certainly wanted to continue speaking Russian. And that's actually another one of the uh, kind of the original sins that these uh, Ukrainian politicians in the Russian mind have, is that they wanted to ban Russian and they were being directed either by the US or by right-wing Nazis, depending on who you believe. We can, we can talk more about the Nazis or the lack of Nazis, but from the Russian point of view, um, Ukraine did have some natural affinities and I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot of people in that region, in the Donbass, in Crimea, who, maybe thought that the Soviet Union was not so bad, right? Ukraine and the, the countries around it got a lot of benefits from being part of the Soviet Union, right? All of that infrastructure, those universities, uh, a lot of the factories and things like that, like Russia, the Soviet Union could have built them all in Russia, but it didn't. It built them in, in those republics as well. And so a lot of their economies are actually built on the infrastructure that the Soviet Union established. Um, Thanks. I have another historical question. Uh, the, the summit between Clinton and Yeltsin back in 1997, mm -hmm. which uh, Putin often refers to, claiming that Yeltsin was promised by Clinton not one inch. In other words, no additional no NATO expansion into the ex-Warsaw Pact. Do you okay. have your own interpretation on what was said at that time and how that's shaken out? Great, okay, then we'll go to one more and you can. Okay, not one inch, that's the first question. Okay. Um, I'm curious, you had mentioned that uh, China has opted not to send airplane parts. I'm just wondering what you think might be behind that. Why are they not supporting more vigorously? Okay. Okay. So the question of whether or not the Russians were promised that NATO would not move one inch beyond Germany, right? That was the, the, the alleged agreement is the Russians would allow Germany to reunify and in exchange NATO wouldn't expand at all to the east. And there's a great book by a woman named Marie Surratt called Not One Inch. Um, and it, it tries to come to the bottom of this. Like, why is it that the Russians insist that this was promised to them and the Americans insist that it wasn't? And it looks like the, the genesis of this idea was that James Baker was the kind of negotiator who would sit down and like try all of these trial balloons. Like, what if we did this? What if we did that? And in one of the conversations he had with Gorbachev, he said, well, what if NATO like would promise not to expand to the east? And Gorbachev's like, yeah, that, that would be a good deal. But it never went further than that. It was never in any agreement. It was never promised by Clinton. But the Russians believed, or they say now, that sort of this was the promise that was made to them that was violated. The, the book is good, the book is about this thick, so I, I wouldn't pretend to have a better interpretation than Mary. <laughs> More than an inch thick. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and then in terms of China, so the, the reaction, the Chinese reaction is very interesting. Russia and China have what they have called a partnership without limits. And every time that Putin is squeezed by the West, for example, after Crimea, he has turned to China and said, you know, basically bail me out here. Like, we're friends. How about you buy my gas instead? So for example, after 2014, the sanctions that were imposed after Crimea, uh, Putin goes to Beijing and they have been trying to negotiate a gas deal for about 10 years. And they can't sign the deal because the, Russian, the Chinese are very tough negotiators and they don't like to pay too much. And the prices that they were offering were lower than what the Russians were going to accept. And the Russians were like, hey, we can send our gas to Europe, we don't need you. But all of a sudden, they were nervous that they weren't going to send their gas to Europe. And they needed that Chinese deal to show that they actually didn't need Europe. So they signed a deal with China at a deep, deep discount. It's a 30-year contract, right? And they're going to lose money, probably, for 30 years, but it was worth it just to show that China has Russia's back. So now the situation is a little bit more complicated, right? China does not really want to be in a conflict with the US and Europe who are much more significant trading partners than Russia is, right? China needs to sell its stuff somewhere, right? And it's basically selling it to us. So they don't want to come out too, strong, too strongly on Russia's side. 
At the same time, like they know that Putin needs him, right? And, and they've kind of got Putin where they want him. And so it doesn't hurt to use the occasional rhetorical flourish talking about partnerships without limit. But China is not willing to go any further than it has to to pacify Putin because they're concerned about the Western reaction. Also, I should point out, they had a lot of trade with Ukraine too before the war. So they're, they're being extremely careful. The, the interesting question also, which you didn't ask, but I, uh, I think you would have if we kept talking, is, you know, what is, does this affect the way China thinks about Taiwan, right? Does China look at Taiwan now and say, hey, like, we could grab some territory too? And I think, you know, what we've heard is that China says, whoa, it's not so easy to grab territory if people don't want to be grabbed. And like, never mind an amphibious landing. And what about those sanctions? Like, would our central bank be sanctioned? Like, would we be cut out of the dollar economy? Like, that is not worth it. So if anything, you know, the, the reaction to Russia in Ukraine and the strength and the unity of the NATO and US reaction has probably given China pause when it comes to being aggressive in Taiwan. All right, we have a question from Zoom from Patrick Ryan at the Tennessee World Affairs Council. And he asks, what are possible responses from Putin to Sweden and Finland joining NATO? He's not happy. <laughs> He's really not happy. Um, you know, the Russians can't do much about it. I, I think they're genuinely shocked, right? They're shocked about a couple things. First, they're shocked that Europe is unified. Because the other thing that I've been hearing in that working group meeting for 10 years, Europe is falling apart, it's a total catastrophe, like every country has its own problems, like there's no way they can come together. They don't say it, but they imply our friend Orban in Hungary is going to make sure that there are no unified policies against us. Um, and they just never took Europe seriously, right? It was just, it was not a player, right? There was Russia, the US, and China, and that's it. And they have been stunned at the extent to which the US, first of all, reasserted leadership after Trump, who didn't care much about Europe or NATO. Europe has, has, the US has not only reasserted leadership, but it has brought Europe along on these very extreme sanctions, which many Europeans were never going to sign on to before. And how did they do this? One of the ways they did this was that incredible release of intelligence leading up to the war, right? All of those maps, like, those maps are amazing. Like, first of all, they have much better resolution than what was the case in Crimea in 2014. Like, that's how fast the technology has developed. And the US was sharing those maps and even more information with all of the Europeans to bring them on board and to start developing the package of sanctions that they would introduce as soon as the conflict took place. And the fact that those, that those sanctions extended to SWIFT and the foreign reserves and the corresponding, all of those factors together would not have been possible and would not have had the, the punch that they did if Europe and the West were divided and, and kind of haggling over you know, what was too much, what was not enough, which is what Putin expected. He expected to see a repeat of the sanctions that were introduced after uh, Crimea, where everyone would say, oh no, like you should not have done that, that's very naughty. Here are the sanctions that we're imposing. And Putin would be like, yeah, okay. And, would continue developing his economy and doing whatever he wanted. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that because the Russians perceived the reaction to Crimea as being not very significant, that they thought that the West was not going to react significantly this time. Conflicts end, it's one way or another. Uh, what does this look like in 10 years? What does post, and, and people die too, that happens. Uh, what, what does uh, post Putin look like, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years? Mary always asks the questions without answers. <laughs> That's why she leaves them for the end. Um, so how does this conflict end? Well, this conflict ends the way all conflicts end, which is a negotiated settlement of one kind or another. And for a while, you know, the Ukrainians were really pushing for negotiations. Actually, negotiations are still happening behind the scenes in Istanbul, but both sides now think that time is on their side, right? The Russians think they're going to lock down that land bridge from Crimea into Donbass and maybe go all the way to Odessa, and the Ukrainians think that they're going to be able to push the Russians back at least to where they were in 2014. At some point, they're going to have to come to the table, and the way it always works is that both sides make concessions. 
they have to be ready to make concessions and they're not there yet. So I suspect what's going to happen is, is I, I had a panel on the economic impact of the war that involved uh, Timofey Milovanov, who's the head of the Kiev School of Economics. And he was sitting in Kiev, he, he had to go down for an air raid in the middle of the panel, but um, he came back and, and I asked him this question, like what does this look like? And he says, this does not look like peace, right? Whatever happens, there's going to be a very messy stalemate for a long time. And if Russia does manage to occupy certain parts of Ukraine, there is going to be a very ugly insurgency for a very long time. So it will be frozen in the sense that frozen conflicts are actually ongoing conflicts that are unresolved. Now what happens to Putin? Yeah, he doesn't look great, right? He's, he's 70, which is not young for a Russian. The average uh, male life expectancy is 65 years. But I, I don't think what we have right now is a Putin problem. I think we have a Russia problem. Because if you look at the people who are around Putin, who are most likely going to replace him if there's a succession, right? Not if there's a, a huge like meltdown and street you know, chaos and a revolution, that's a different story. But if we assume that there is a succession process and it's someone from the inner circle that takes over, most of them are more hardline than Putin himself. Right? And I don't see any of them who would be playing like the dove card. That has never been particularly popular in Russia. And I suspect that they would be inclined to continue the line, maybe reduce Russia's losses. You know, maybe they can say, you know, let, let's pull back to Donetsk and Luhansk. But uh, I, I, I'm not counting on that as being, you know, the, the kind of easy resolution to the conflict. Okay, well, uh, let's go upstairs and have some conversation and soft drinks. And before that, let us thank very much Alexandra Beckham.